Hello and welcome back to my channel. And if it's your first time here, be sure to like and subscribe. I'm trying to hit the modest number of a billion subscribers because I just want that YouTube blood money. I upload the latest spoilers and do chapter reviews multiple times a week. Be sure to comment your opinions below. Let's jump straight into the final chapters of the Egghead arc. Alright, so we have the full chapter summary and spoilers of One Piece 1117. And I've seen a fair amount of discourse and rage surrounding this chapter, mainly because people think they haven't been told what the Will of D actually is. And if you think at this point you deserve to know what the Will of D is, then you're entitled to look at it, and you're kind of missing the point of the story. What you should actually be mad about is the horrible pacing we've been subjected to over the last five years. We went through four years of Wano and basically three years of nothing just to get 80% of the story's exposition from one character in like three chapters. It's just awful. But I'll give you a little insight to the Will of D and the fact that it's going to be pretty much completely irrelevant at the end of the story or when you find out what it is. The Will of D is probably going to be something, you know, in relation to Emu, not actually Joy Boy. Emu is likely to be Nefertari D. Lily, who existed 800 years ago at the same time as Joy Boy, and we don't get the name Joy D. Boy. But I think people with the Will of D are the descendants in the blood of Emu. Yet that isn't actually relevant to what the Will of D is. Garp has pretty much already explained that the Will of D is that the old make way for the new, and to accept that reality. Hence why it's the new generation that's going to topple the 800 year old regime. Anyway, like and subscribe for more manga and anime content and let's get into the full chapter. The cover page starts with Yamato hugging Big Cat with Little Man looking onwards. We then move to a scene at Hachinosu where the pirates are talking about the treasure that must be under the ocean, saying to one another, does that mean there could be a bunch of treasure on the ocean floor? To which another pirate responds, you pea brain, it's not like the world is full of cities of gold. It's all 200 meters deep. But aren't there ships that can dive? How the devil do we afford one of those? There's then a panel of Chestnut Boy talking to his pirate crew about going diving for some treasure. We then change scenes to the Navy General Hospital where the members of S.W.O.R.D. are. Captain Morgan Jr. says to Colby that this must all be about the One Piece. Colby says I'm gonna pass out, I write down everything later. It's hard to keep up with all these thoughts racing around in my head. Colby then says to Prince, Hey, things are really coming to a head, aren't they? To which he responds, yeah, it sounds like we're gonna get some hard to hear answers soon. And then we see X Drake brooding in hospital alone. We then see a panel of Smoker saying he's at the general hospital. Stella's message says, still revealing information. I realize I have been quite vague on this point. However, I can't add anything further other than pure speculation, and all the pirates just want to know what the One Piece is. We then move our attention to Egghead where Bonnie points out that the barrier is lifting. The Straw Hat crew are talking amongst one another. The clouds have stopped stretching? Don't worry, this is more than enough. We should be able to reach the sea, no problem. Yeah, the only issue is we'll be landing right on top of fleet ships. Brook says he's loaded the cola bottles and that they can blast off at any moment's notice. Zoro and Jinbei say they're close to the ship. They say they wound up chasing after a strange monster, to which the crew responds, this is no time for detours, get over here now. Zoro says I'm not taking a detour, the monster is heading right for you, look sharp. We then see Venus jumping onto the Thousand Sunny in his awakened form with his Koetsu blade drawn, with the narration saying there is something special about his presence. Everyone on the Thousand Sunny looks shocked at the presence of the Elder. Jinbei then uses Katagurama, and Zoro uses two sword styles to provide his bliss, Rashmon. Venus and Zoro clash swords, and Zoro notes that the Elder has a Kitetsu blade. Black Lightning appears, Zoro is knocked back but caught by Jinbei. Zoro says launch the ship and we'll jump on. There is no time to waste. We then head to the northeast coast of Egghead, where Bonnie says Straw Hat's still not here. We can't hold him much longer. We see Sanji calling out to Luffy as their signal is not getting through to him. Luffy then yells back, we're here, get ready to set sail. Sanji says, alright, there's no mistaking that voice. We then move over to the Giants fight with the Marines and the Vice Admirals. The Giants are trying to prepare their ships so that they can escape. 
Vice Admiral Bluegrass then says, you're all meant to be paragons of justice, remember? Don't settle for being another face in the crowd, step up and be a star. She then punches a hole in the pirate ship. Vice Admiral Dolly then punches the Giants captain. We then see the Giants call out for Kashi as he's taken out. The chapter then switches to scenes of Luffy and Mercury. Luffy looks around confused as he's not able to see Mercury, and he says, wasn't that boar just behind us a second ago? Dory and Broggy then respond, that's great, now we just gotta worry about boarding the ship. You said it, it's high time we set sail. They wonder where he went though. We then see all four elders except for Venus surround the Iron Giant that's broadcasting Stella's message. Stella's message, still broadcasting, says I have one last message I wish to impart. It is for those who are scattered all across the world. We then hear the inner monologue of Sailor Mars. He thinks to himself, wait, is that? Yes, it is the very Iron Giant which rampaged through Mary Jua 200 years ago. There can be no doubt of that. Stella's message then continues and he says, those of you who carry the letter D in your name. We then see Dragon, Sabo, Colby and Blackbeard. However, the four elders destroy the Iron Giant, cutting off Stella's message early. We then see everyone's reaction to the signal getting jammed and not knowing what the meaning of the letter D is. We then see the Iron Giant ripped apart as the chapter ends. And now, what is the will of D? And like I said earlier, who cares? One Piece is a story that's all about the journey and not about the destination. Despite Goldini's crew reaching the destination of One Piece, it wasn't a solution. Without the characters going on the journey that they go on, they would not have the capacity to be able to do any of the things that they're actually doing right now. The journey is what is making characters capable of creating change. I think it's likely that the letter D represents something that we won't expect. Simply because I don't think it's going to be a flattering trait to any character and I don't think it's going to be a defining trait of any character. Whether or not you have D in your name is not going to define what you accomplish by the end of the story. I mean, people build this stuff up so much in their head that it's not going to matter what the answer is, it's never going to suffice. Alright, so we have the full chapter spoilers for One Piece chapter 1118, and we're definitely finding out more about Bonnie and her transformation into Nika. At least her fruit's variation of Nika anyway. Which leads me to believe there are going to be more characters that transform into Nika other than Bonnie and Luffy. It probably sounds crazy to say that I think Teach is going to have a form of Nika as well. And obviously each awakening of Nika is going to be unique in its own way. But I don't think it's solely going to be a case of your fruit determines your awakening. I think it's going to be more revolved around your personality. And also the will that you inherited from the devil fruits. I think there's going to be a lot more nuance to the awakening of Gear 5 and Nika. I think there's going to be a point where Luffy transforms into Gear 5 and he's not going to be joyful. And I think who you are is going to determine how you awaken these fruits. Anyway, like and subscribe and let's get straight into the chapter. So the spoilers this week see the protagonist Monkey D. Luffy team up with Jewelry Bonnie at the issues and to take on a Gorosei member. While Bonnie would normally be severely outclassed by the Gorosei members, she unlocks a new form in this installment's final pages which sees her able to fight shoulder to shoulder with Luffy. Which shouldn't happen, but it does anyway. The title of this chapter is Be Free. The beginning of the spoilers focus on Yamato's cover story, showing Yamato leaving the capital while eating a bento. The spoilers then focus in on this story's content, starting off immediately where the last one ended by showing the Iron Giant sinking into the sea. The Iron Giant is thinking about Joy Boy as it's sinking into the sea, asking where he is and saying he thought he was here just a moment ago. A bit more of Dr. Vegapunk's message is then played, this time being just his voice from the transmission transponder sound rather than the full broadcast. Dr. Vegapunk is heard saying, the name is with no other words shared, and I believe Dr. Vegapunk might be sharing the name of the original D, which may be Nefertari D. Lily or Emu, who may very well be the same person. I'm sure we'll find out more about the Will of D soon though. We then begin seeing the global reaction to the interruption of Dr. Vegapunk's message. In Alabaster, Koza is shown slightly pondering what's happening while citizens argue about whether or not Luffy or the world government is to blame. In Whiskey Peak, where Miss Monday and Mr. Nine are seen with their son, 
citizens are in disbelief that the world government would kill Dr. Vegapunk regardless of what he did given his genius. So the people of Whiskey Peak think Dr. Vegapunk's death was unjustified regardless. In Dress Rosa, Leo and Rebecca are seen arguing about whether or not Luffy is responsible for Dr. Vegapunk's death. The focus then returns to Egghead Island, where Vegapunk York wastes no time by reminding the Gorosei that Vegapunk Lilith and Vegapunk Atlas are still active. She also emphasises that punk records will keep growing even after Stella's body death. So yeah, Stella's brain-computer thing is still learning despite the fact that he's dead. Which is pretty cool. We then see the Gorosai decide to prioritise eliminating these remaining Vegapunks. So according to the spoilers, the Gorosai want to kill the remaining Vegapunks, not capture them. This is why Luffy, Dory and Broggy are shown boarding the giant warrior's pirate ship. Bonnie, Sanji and Frankie are also confirmed to be on board. While the Marines keep fighting a losing battle against the giants for the sake of pride and the force they've shown. Bonnie then makes things worse for the Marines by using her powers to transform Vice Admiral Dahl and Bluegrass, as well as the weaponized sea beasts Bluegrass was riding into children. This in turn allows the giant warrior's pirate ship to set sail, while Bonnie teases the two disgruntled Vice Admirals. We then see Luffy greet Uimo and the almost unconscious Kashi, while Sanji contacts Nami and says they've successfully set sail. Nami then tells Sanji they're taking off too, but no news is given regarding Zoro, Jinbei, or the Gorosei member Venus. Luffy then heads to the ship's kitchen and begins eating all the food he can find, while the Gorosei member Mars flies to the giant warrior's pirate ship and attacks it with a beam. Three giants use their shields to block part of the attack, but a section of the ship still catches fire. At this moment, Luffy suddenly reappears topside and transforms to his Gear 5 form, exciting the ship to fight again. The oceans in the ship shake from Luffy's Gear 5 power while he calls out to Bonnie. He tells her they should go together since she wants to hit the Gorosei too, to which she says she can't do it. However, Luffy says that while he may not understand her power, he knows she can do it. Bonnie then first remembers meeting Luffy on Egghead, and how she said he looks like Nika when he's free. Bonnie then remembers Kuma's flashback, which doesn't make much sense to me because I don't know how you could possibly remember someone else's flashback. So to correct that, Bonnie has her own flashback. Specifically the moment he promised to raise Bonnie in front of Ginny's grave. She then uses her Toshi Toshi devil fruit powers to transform into Nika. Because you know it only took Luffy 1100 chapters to do that. Bonnie calls her ability to transform into Nika Distortion Future. And this sees her transform into her own version of Nika. Although she emphasised to have the exact same transformation as Luffy's. With white clouds floating around her neck, white curly hair, white clothes except her sash, and eyes with ring-like pupils. And it's interesting she gets the ring-like pupils, because a lot of people assume that meant that the Oppo Oppo no Me was used on them, in order to grant them immortality, which doesn't seem to be the case. A double page spread sees a transformed Bonnie posing next to Luffy, who is laughing in a way similar to when Gear 5 was officially introduced. Bonnie, meanwhile, is mirroring a pose of Luffy's from the Volume 106 cover. The Marines and Giants alike are in shock, with the former calling them White Giants, while the latter recognises the pair as two Nikas. We then see the Gorosei members St. Mercury and St. Jupiter sense a weird presence deciding to go towards the giant warrior's pirate ship. Luffy and Bonnie, meanwhile, prepare to face Mars, who silently stares at them. The issue ends with the Iron Giant activating once more under the sea, saying he's here. So the title of this chapter is called Emeth, which is a reference to the name of the Iron Giant, as revealed later on in the issue. The chapter begins with the cover story, showing kids throwing rocks at Yamato, who hate Kaido. The story then opens with a focus inside the Lava phase, where Kaku has been released from his bubble by Stuffy. However, Kaku is mad at her for the last words Edison said to her, scoffing at the idea of them being friends. Kaku tells Sassi to leave before Luchi arrives, but he's seen holding back tears as he says this. 
The chapter then shifts focus to the northeastern shore of Egghead Island, where the giants are cheering for Luffy and Bonnie. Orosu member St. Marcus Mars meanwhile scoffs at the idea of there being two Nikas, calling Bonnie's transformation a fake one. He then attacks the giant warrior's pirate ship with another fire blast, but Luffy is able to block it after transforming into his gigantic balloon form. Luffy then grabs Mars' wings while explaining to Sanji and the others that the Gorosu can't be injured, so they need to focus on creating distance. Luffy then asks Sanji, Frankie and Bonnie to attack his balloon body with everything they have, with the latter most being shocked but all follow his plan in the end. Like we heard in the early spoilers, they all did a combined attack together and this is what it was. We then see each individual character use one of their strongest attacks, with Bonnie's being a Nika punch, which suggests she can't copy Luffy's abilities in Gear 5, at least yet. Luffy shouts that it hurts because they use Haki, with it being unclear based on the spoilers if this is referring to Sanji or if it confirms Bonnie and Frankie as Armin and Haki uses too. Luffy then makes his body even bigger and pulls Mars into his belly before using the gum gum white balloon move to combine the aforementioned trio's attack with his own strength. This blows Mars away across the ocean to the point where he disappears in the sky with a twinkle like Team Rocket from Pokemon. So we get a bunch more Looney Tunes childish trash from Gear 5 like usual. I'm gonna be honest, I think Gear 5 kinda sucks and the constant affirmation of spreading joy is annoying. And I understand the point behind it, but that doesn't mean I have to like it. Anyway, I'll digress. We then see the giant's pirate ship begin to set sail while Luffy asks where Usopp and company are. With Sanji just saying they're late with no update given about anyone in the Labo phase in this chapter. Atlas then tells Sanji that they need to go do something first. This is presumably referring to the Vegapunks. As Atlas contacts Lilith in her head shortly thereafter to confirm that York is able to track their movements. Atlas begins to say that they have no doubt about this, but focus changes before she finishes her sentence. Fans are then taken underwater, where the Iron Giant is seen getting up. This also causes the transmission transponder snail to resume its broadcast. With Dr. Vegapunk's words here, it's said to be the following. The thing that was inherited can be called a will. I hope this message will reach those who are swayed by the cause. And at this point, I just really don't care about what the will of D is at all. It's just going to be a state of mind that you inherit, similar to how some Devil Fruit users inherit the will of their previous users. I think the story is building up the will of D way too much for what it's ultimately going to be. Getting back to the chapter, the global reactions to the broadcast resumption are shown. With Whole Cake Island showing Katakuri, Moscato, Brownie and Zucotto wondering what he's talking about, Vivi and Big News Morgan are also seen in shock at the broadcast resuming. Gaiman and Sarfunkel's reactions are also seen, but hilariously they're unaware of the broadcast since they don't own any transponder snails at all. Focus then returns to Egghead Island, where Vegapunk York tells the Gorosei that the transponder snail has different circuits for the transmission, so the only way to fully stop the broadcast is to destroy it totally. Saint Jupiter is then seen at the northeastern coast, spitting out cipher pole agents and the seraphim onto the marine ships nearby. So I guess that's one of the nifty abilities the sandworm has? We then see Jupiter begin sucking back the giant warrior's pirate ship, prompting Luffy to jump back to shore and punch his face to stop him. However, this allows Mercury to leap for the Elbaf ship, immediately crashing into it as Luffy and the others react to this. It is also revealed here that Bonnie is already back into a child form, clearly unable to maintain her totally free future form for long. Luffy, however, notices something moving underwater, which is revealed to be the Iron Giant who is remembering a conversation he had with Joy Boy. While fans don't see Joy Boy here, they do hear his words, which reveal the Iron Giant's name is Emeth. Joy Boy tells Emeth that when the time comes, there's something he must do. However, during this chapter, we don't get to learn what this task is. With the sentence being heard as Emeth rises out of the water and punches Mercury in the face. Emeth breaks one of Mercury's fangs in the process, seemingly being the first to actually damage Agorosei this arc. The chapter then ends with various reactions to this turn of events. The chapter begins with a flashback to 26 years ago at Punk Hazard. Vegapunk is having a conversation with Professor Clover from O'Hara, who was taken out not long after this event by the Buster Call. 
Clover Wallet Punk has it, says I employ you Vega Punk. Please aid in our research, it is imperative that we study the void century. The world's history can't remain shrouded in darkness. Our research requires expertise in numerous fields. Vegapunk responds to Clover by saying I work for the government now, I can't afford to leak my findings. To which Clover responds with how many times have they caught you anyway, open your eyes. Can't you see that they keep letting you go free? Vegapunk then says they're hoping to flush out your allies, so stand down. Let the past remain shrouded, you won't find the answer to good and evil in a bunch of old stories. Clover looks at Vegapunk and says I once knew someone who carried a D in their name. We grew up together. He was killed right in front of me. He was my big brother. My real name is Clayom D. Clover. When he was killed, I said we were only friends. I lied that day to save myself. So tell me, how am I supposed to accept a world where you can die for just having the wrong name? History will only continue to be suppressed and the people will never know. Vegapunk says I'll forget what you just told me, but I'm afraid I can't help you. So do your best to stay safe. Clover yells out to Vegapunk and says the voices of the past call out to you, just wait. I'll solve this puzzle and when I do, you won't be able to ignore them. We then go to a flashback from 22 years ago where Caesar is talking to Vegapunk. Caesar asks Vegapunk if he'd heard the news from the West Blue. O'Hara came face to face with a buster call, take a look, it's the biggest massacre ever. They finally got that archaeologist Clover. That's what happens when you look into the void century, no one's ever gonna make that mistake again. Vegapunk then holds up a wanted poster of Nico Robin and says, oh, it looks like some brat managed to survive. Vegapunk, realizing that Clover is gone, thinks to himself, you chose death, was passing on your research that important? You fools, did you really expect someone to be curious enough to follow in your footsteps after this? The chapter then returns to the present at Egghead Island. We hear Vegapunk's message continue once again. He said that someone once told me that the voices of the past call out to you, and that history is written by the victors, and the words of the vanquished are usually cast into a deep, dark ocean, which is both a reference to O'Hara and the Void Century. We see a panel of Robin holding a hand over a face as Vegapunk continues to talk. That being said, the truth can still come to light if the oppressed carry it on their backs and endure. We see Zoro yelling at Lilith to hurry up and blast off. Vegapunk's message continues in the background saying, For my part, I'm leaving this to the world. Lilith then responds to Zoro saying, It's no good, we can't. Because that old centaur is gonna keep attacking us. We're finished if he does, this ship can only fly for a kilometre. If the geezer disrupts our trajectory even a little, we won't make it. We see Nasajuro getting ready to attack the boat. Lilith continues to speak, the wind's blowing north and that's reducing our lift. Any further jolts will make us fall short of our projected landing zone. Then out of nowhere, everyone on the boat is shocked when Atlas punches Lilith. Zoro getting ready to attack asks Atlas why she did that to Lilith. Atlas then picks up Lilith and says she'll leave her in Zoro's hands. Atlas tells them all to take off and that she'll take care of Nasajuro herself. Everyone on the boat is confused and asks what she's talking about. We then see York saying Lilith's access has been severed so Atlas is the only one left. So Atlas tricked York into thinking that she's the last Vegapunk and saved Lilith's life. Atlas flies off to attack Nasajuro and Jinbei says let's go, we'll regret it if we hesitated now. Zoro yells at Brook to do it and then Brook uses the coop to burst. As the crew fly away on the sunny, Nasajuro cuts off one of Atlas's arms, but Atlas manages to grab hold of the elder in the process. We then return to the other four elders, the Iron Giant and Luffy. The Iron Giant begins speaking and says, Joy Boy, I'm happy that we meet again. However, Luffy is busy looking over at Jupiter. Emeth says to Luffy, overhear you, confirming that he's referring to Luffy as Joy Boy. Luffy turns to Emeth as Emeth says, I came like before, your enemy is my enemy, I am glad. I can fight for you again, Joy Boy. To which Luffy responds, you can talk, that's so cool. Emeth says I'll protect you from danger, Joy Boy. We see Jupiter and Mercury coming towards Luffy and the Iron Giant. 
They say to one another we must pound them to dust. It seems Vegapunk's speech is all but over. We then see the giants on their pirate ship shouting and asking, Hey Straw Hat, is he a friend? Referring to the Iron Giant. To which Luffy responds, not really. He was saying something about protecting someone called Joy Boy. Who even is that? The giants are then a bit perplexed as they say it talked. We didn't hear a thing. Luffy also surprised says, oh, really? The giants then make their escape while the elders are focused on the Iron Giant. Vegapunk's message still continues to play in the background saying, I think we should be able to scrutinise and learn from the past from every possible perspective. I only wish I had more time. We see Jupiter begin to attack Emeth as Vegapunk's message says, but there are those who can't be stopped. Emeth gets ready to launch an attack and then stops Jupiter with one hand. Mercury yells at Jupiter to crush them where they stand. The giants watching from afar say it seems the last 900 years have rendered those weapons inoperable referring to the Iron Giant. Saint Saturn then jumps towards Luffy and the giant saying I will not let you escape. Mercury glares towards Kuma and Bonnie as he's heading towards the ship. The scene then switches to the sunny where Zoro says hold on tight we're going down as we see the Sunny catching up with the rest of the crew in the other escaping ships. We then see Nasajuro and Atlas fighting each other. Nasajuro cuts Atlas with his sword and asks, so you mean to make a grand sacrifice of yourself? To which Atlas responds with, nah, I'm just lending a hand. She then grabs hold of Nasajuro and blows herself up. Atlas destroys herself attempting to save everybody else. In the final panel, we see the Sunny landing with the rest of the ships while Vegapunk's message continues to play. Vegapunk says 25 years ago, the pirate Goldie, Roger, achieved the unprecedented by circumnavigating the globe. I have no doubt that they heard the whole thing, the entire truth of the world. We then see York celebrating because Atlas's signal is gone, so she thinks every Vegapunk but her has been destroyed. We then see Nasajuro regenerating while Saturn says we have let you say too much, Stella. We then see Emeth fighting Jupiter and Mercury. Emeth says to himself, oh my, I have really rusted away. This is the time you spoke of, right Joy Boy? Emeth then asks, can I use it? Vegapunk continues to speak saying I am confident you have all come to the same conclusion at this point and I anticipate that is what will ultimately determine how things transpire in the future. The chapter then ends with Vegapunk saying they must have heard the voices of the past from the purest source possible. So what is the purest source possible from over 900 years ago? This chapter is called The Upheaval of the Era. The chapter begins with Saturn attacking the Elbaf ship with Luffy and Bonnie on it. Luffy tells the giants to watch out for Saturn's claws because they're poisonous. The giants respond by saying we're trying not to touch them, but Saturn's attacks are too fierce. Saturn then tries to attack Bonnie, but Luffy knocks away his claw. Bonnie then gets up and Luffy tells her that she has to be the one to take out Saturn. Saturn then stares at Bonnie, saying her name. The chapter then changes scenes to Vegapunk's broadcast across the world. He says one day the memories of the void century will be recalled and mark my words that day is coming. We then see Vivi and Shirohoshi reacting to Vegapunk's broadcast as he says the sinking of the world's continents was a man-made disaster brought about by the weapons. Weapons which by someone's design still exist today. So he's saying someone's intentionally keeping around the ancient weapons. Vegapunk continues to speak saying the machinations of history and fate seem to insist upon the obliteration of those descendants of rare races. We then see a flashback of Vegapunk and Kuma with Vegapunk asking are you a buccaneer and Kuma asking what makes my blood different from other people's. We then see a flashback of Marco and Whitebeard as Whitebeard says there used to be a race of gods atop the red line. We then see King bandaged in a dark room with other people referring to him as a Lunarian. That being the race of gods that Whitebeard is referring to. We then see a panel of pudding being mocked for having three eyes. These being the examples of races that the world government has been trying to wipe out. We then switch back to the fight between Saturn, Luffy and Bonnie. We see Bonnie transform into a Nika form again and says if there's one score I have to settle it's with you. Saturn then says with that mimicry a pale imitation. Luffy then tells Bonnie to get him and attack Saturn. Bonnie then stomps Saturn multiple times as he looks shocked. We see Luffy laughing and Bonnie crying.
We see a flashback of Kuma and Saturn, with Saturn saying your only options are slavery and death. History itself chose them for you. We then go back to the present, with Bonnie saying you'll pay for what you did to my daddy and to my mummy. We then see another flashback of Saturn telling Bonnie that he performed chemical experiments on a mother. We then switch back to the present, where Bonnie says to Saturn, you people aren't gods, but gods do exist. Bonnie is crying and shouting, I wish we could have lived together as a family. There were times I wanted to die if I had to be alone. But I won't. I'm going to live. Because they would have wanted me to be alive. Referring to Ginny and Kuma. We then see Bonnie gearing up to do a massive attack called Liberation Nika Punch. The chapter then returns to Vegapunk's message across the world. He says if the worst should come to pass, I want you all to take care of yourselves. No matter what should happen, I believe in the intelligence of mankind. I believe in science. Roger died 25 years ago, Whitebeard died 2 years ago. But the fall of these heroes was merely the prologue of a new era. And just quickly, if you're enjoying this video, remember to like, subscribe and comment. I still want to hit that modest number of 1 billion subscribers. We then cut back to Bonnie using the Liberation Nika punch against Saturn and smashing him. We see Saturn get ripped apart and punched full of holes and then knocked off the boat. We hear Vegapunk's broadcast playing in the background as he says, And now these people who refuse to buckle under any and all suppression are the ones who are closest to the truth, ironically enough. Then again, perhaps it was Roger who sent them there. We then see all the giants Luffy and Kuma congratulate Bonnie for taking out Saturn. As this is happening, the sun he lands near the Elbaf ship. We then see a flashback of Roger from the first chapter before his execution. He says, my treasure? Why, it's right where I left it. It's yours if you can find it. I've left everything in the world there. We see Rayleigh asleep and some pirates cheering on Vegapunk. Vegapunk continues saying the person who winds up with it may not be the one Joy Boy desired. We then see panels of the Blackbeard and the Red Hair Pirates listening to the broadcast. We then see a panel of the Cross Guild and Buggy, Mihawk and Crocodile also listening to the broadcast while the Pirates cheer on Buggy. We then see Marines at the Marine HQ saying it cannot happen, we must find it first. Vegapunk's broadcast continues as he says there is no stopping the tide. The fate of the world now rests in the hands of the ones who find it, the person who lays claim to the One Piece. We then see a huge double page spread of the most important characters in the whole entire manga. Like, subscribe and comment, that's the end of the chapter. There's a break next week, but I'll release the spoilers as soon as they're out. Thank you for watching.